There's a fine line between business, making a living, and having a slower progression, and making sure that you can pay your bills, and then still attaining the same result. Howdy. What's happening, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 536, with Sensei Lorenzo Sandoval. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here for Martial Arts Radio. And everything that we're doing with this show is to connect, educate, and entertain the martial artists of the world. If you want to know more about the show, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Now, how do we afford to bring you two shows every week for free without commercials? Well, we sell some stuff and we've got a Patreon. And here's what you can do to help support what we do at Whistlekick. You could go to whistlekick.com, you can make a purchase in the store, and we're even going to give you a discount. Podcast 15 gets you 15% off. If you want to go a little deeper, and if you like the content that we do, please consider this. We have a Patreon account, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash whistlekick, and from the Patreon, we give you exclusive stuff. We have blog posts where we talk about the upcoming guests or maybe give you some behind the scenes. We do exclusive audio, exclusive video. And as we roll out new book drafts or training programs, depending on the tier you're in, we release those for free to people in the Patreon. So go check that out. Now, why do we do what we do? Because we love traditional martial arts. I love traditional martial arts. And if you're listening, I'm guessing you do as well. You can follow us on social media to see how much we love it, all the things that we're we're doing, the fun and the trials and the tribulations. Can you see say trials without tribulations? I'm not sure. I, I, I tried to, and it did not work. <laughs> You've got other ways you can help us too. Sharing episodes, following, linking, reviewing, any of that stuff is good, and it is appreciated. Today's guest, as with most, comes in from a listener suggestion, and I believe today's guest is our first coming to us from the heart of Sin City. That's right, Las Vegas. Sensei Lorenzo Sandoval has lived and trained in Las Vegas his entire life. And we talk about what that means, what that looked like, not only as a kid, but as an adult, as a school owner, as a competitor. We talk about some pretty real stuff on today's show, and I think that you're going to enjoy it. So here we go. Sensei Sandoval, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hello, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Good. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, thank you. All right. Well, you know, we, we talk to a lot of people. We talk to martial artists of all styles, all over the world, and everybody does stuff differently. And that's one of the things I love about martial arts is that our paths go in such different directions. I talked to somebody earlier today who, who had a, another similar but unique path, and here we are 500-something episodes in, and we find that everybody's path goes off into some way that reflects who they are. And yet every path has a beginning. And for almost everybody, that beginning is, is stepping into a class somewhere at some time. So what's your beginning? How'd you get started with martial arts? Well, um, honestly, it was my uncle. He was a third Don under Usumo Ozawa. And if nobody knows who Ozawa is, uh, Ozawa is one of the first Shotokan practitioners in Las Vegas. And so he brought Shotokan to the Las Vegas community. And he was actually trained by Genshin Funakoshi himself. So he trained my uncle. um, And at the time, uh, you know, very similar story. I was a troubled child, wasn't listening. And I didn't really get along in team sports. And I didn't really like, I just, I couldn't vibe with team sports or being in a group. So martial arts was perfect for me. I had a really abusive stepfather, actually, Mm. who's used me really bad. Um, but the irony in that was his brother ended up teaching me in the martial arts. And uh, so my uncle took the time out of his day. And um, I used to watch him jump like six feet in the air and do like spinning hook kicks on a paper lantern. It was crazy. So for eight hours until about three in the morning, he taught me basically all the basics from a ba- basic punch, rising block, you know, the, the works, the basics that most martial arts teach, most striking traditional martial arts teaches. So within that eight hours until three in the morning, I sat in front of the mirror and I only learned like maybe six moves. And it was very difficult for me and I was very frustrated um, because I wasn't very good at all. I was, 
I was uh, stumbling upon myself. I couldn't bend my knee right. Um, you know, there was a lot of things about me in the martial arts. Um, and I'm not very talented. You know, I'm very, uh, I have a lot of heart, but when it comes to learning something new, you know, I wanted to, I have to put a lot of effort into it. And I, I think that's everybody, but I feel like, especially me, uh, that I have to, you know, put that extra effort. But yeah, that's how I got into the martial arts was my uncle, you know, started me in my very first lesson is in his apartment. And then from there, you know, I just, I fell in love with it. It was an escape. My mother was uh, a uh, psychiatric ward nurse. And so she worked 14 hour days. So it was, uh, it was an escape for me. So, you know, I, as a 12 year old, 13 year old boy, I would have to take the bus in the middle of no, in the middle of the city. And I would have to come home like 10 PM alone. So she, most of my, the majority of my training wasn't, um, it was a very lonely path. <laughs> so, you know, but you know, my mother supported me financially. So I was very, very grateful for that. So. Were you aware at the time that this was an escape for you? Um, no, no. When I was a teenager, uh, it was, you know, I had a very, things were always tense at the house with my, with my stepfather. So I never wanted to be home in general. So having karate as a, a way of life for me was a huge benefit. And I didn't really think anything of it until, you know, as I got older, like everybody. Right. So, yeah. but my, my, my point was, was I just wanted to be able to just, you know, do something that I really love. And I just fell in love with it. And, uh, you know, and that's, that's pretty much it. Um, I, I could go over the other instructors I trained with, but I'm sure I don't want to trail off too much. So no, that's all right. That's all right. That's all right. Well, I'm sure we'll, we'll get to them. You know, I'll, like I said, everybody's journey starts somewhere. It heads somewhere and we're going to not necessarily in chronological order, but we're going to, we're going to march down that path and we're going to learn a lot about you as we go. But I want, I want to stay with this idea of escape for a moment, because as, as we listen to guests come on this show, as we think about our own personal journeys, martial arts represents something to all of us. And it's important, but the reason it's important and the way that manifests can be really different and dramatically different. And right. I'm curious, you know, here you've got this, this beacon that is martial arts and, and your uncle and their providing you something pretty pretty powerful and important and you know we certainly don't need to to go deeper than that to speculate what might have been otherwise i'm wondering about other aspects of your life though at that time school friends what so was going on for you there i grew up in a i grew up in a a uh, a loss so at the time vegas is a very hard community at the time because there wasn't a lot of um, community events that were happening in the city because most of it was desert. You know, I was born in the desert, you know, I'll probably end up dying in the desert, but um, you know, I got very lucky. A lot of us, you know, school systems out here are very, um, they're kind of treated like women's prisons, <laughs> you know, uh, they're actually designed out of women's prisons. That's a, that's a fact. But one of the things that makes Vegas hard is because it's so hot. It's hard you know, a lot of kids don't go outside and play. So, you know, I was very fortunate in that I lived in a cul-de-sac um, where I knew a group of friends that I was, they actually raised me instead. And I grew up with, you know, different colors from blacks to whites to Mexicans. You know, we had, you know, we, and then we, we just, we were like the sandlot, exactly like the sandlot. Mm. You know, we played on the cul-de-sac. We, we did so many things and we did, you know, we played games, we would always hang out. Um, but when I, when I started karate, that, that all changed a lot more, but we still stay close. You know, we still talk today. Um, but um, the most important thing I think about that is, you know, in Vegas, like I'm saying, it's very hard to find that community inside your neighborhood. And I got lucky. I got very, very lucky uh, with that because of where we lived at the time. So. Yeah, whether whether luck or fate or somebody watching out for you, it sounds like uh, yeah, sounds like you made the the best out of maybe a less than ideal start. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. I've been. I feel like it's mostly luck, and I I'm really grateful. I think we all have to be grateful with our journeys, and we we have to look at the 
the positives because if, if you're constantly thinking in a negative mindset, I just don't think that's healthy at all, personally. Mm-hmm. So. I agree. I agree. Now, you foreshadowed a little bit earlier, you know, your uncle wasn't the only person who trained you. How long were you training with him? Uh, I trained with him for like a few classes. And then after that, um, the teacher that I had was James Tawato. And James Tawato now runs the Las Vegas School of Shotokan Karate on Sahara, next to the Palace Station. You know, so it's, uh, he's, a, he's a great, great guy. Um, you know, one of the things I love about him is that uh, he has strong foundations and basics. Like if, if anybody knows what the karate community is, we, we, there are three principles to Shotokan, which is Kihon, which is basics, Kumite, which is fighting, and then you have Kata. And then of course you have Bunkai. So Bunkai is the application of the Kata. But what I really loved about James Tawato was after Ozawa died, because Ozawa died in 97, um, James took over the Las Vegas School of and Karate. And one of the great things about him was he, he taught me that foundations of basics and stances and, you know, telling me to do things over and over again. And I hated that. It was so boring. I mean, I just, I hated him for making me do that crap. And you know, I'd go back and forth. He'd go, you know, he'd count in Japanese. He'd go, itch, me, son. And he'd go forward and back. And then we'd do it again. And we'd do it again. But honestly, now looking at it as doing it, martial arts as a career, I mean, James Tawato really, really instilled in me. And because of that, I, I won a lot of titles. I won a lot of kata titles. I even fought in Japan. You know, he gave me a really, really strong foundation. And that's what his school is known for is those those basics those fundamentals and fundamentals are, are really, really important in, 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 in anything you know and uh, people forget about that a lot of times sometimes you don't have to do 20 techniques to hit somebody you just hit them once and you're good you know what I mean? <laughs> and that's that's the foundation of Shotokan is that you some people get so focused on you know trying to make it so complicated and karate is not that type of art where you know you you make sure it counts the first time, but you train so many times that, and so many increments to make sure that, you know, it's, it's relevant. And that's what James taught me was repetition was key to create a foundation and, and become a good, good black belt or a shodan, which means mm. black belt. So. Yeah. Wow. Now you're, you're talking about hindsight and the importance of basics, which I get. And, I'm going to guess almost everybody listening gets. And you're talking about how it felt at the time as a teenager, right? Where I've done this. I know this. I don't need to do this 10,000 more times because that's how we all are as teenagers. Yeah. we. But, you know, I I hated it, but I loved it too. I mean, it was, I don't know why I just kept coming back. And I just think um, I really wanted to just become it was just an escape, you know, and it was the wild thing about that too, was it was such a nasty dojo. Sometimes, <laughs> you know, the floors would smell like feet and the, the, the windows in Vegas during the winter time, uh, it would fog up. It would fog up so much that, you know, our sweat would fog up the mirrors. Like you're inside of a car. It was just, it was just really wild. And, um, you know, it was just, you know, and none of my partners were kids. All my partners were, were grown, big, huge, buff, hairy men. And I just remember going, you know, wow, why did I go through that? And what was really bad, and I love James, but sometimes some of the men would never wash their uniforms, ever. So it was like, so it was like you know, every time they would hit you or they would take you down, you would feel the sweat, you know, on your, on your cheek. <laughs> you know? So it was just- Old it was, sweat. Yeah, just, you know, and I had this guy too, and I love him. Um, I'm not going to say his name, but he was, <laughs> he had a huge beard and he had a, he also had a, but he was a mechanic. So he would just put on his gi, wouldn't wash it. And I'm just like, man, you know, not, you know, but you know, it, it, it's, that's just part of how it was. There was no, you know, and at the time there was no gear, you know, a lot of, uh, in traditional karate gear wasn't a big thing you know we they would only we call them socks do you know what socks are i do yeah we call them socks and we would put them on our hands and we would fight and it was like this thin lawyer of cotton in your knuckles and you didn't have shin guards you didn't have helmet if you got hit you got hit you know and 
it was it was a rough rough day for me <laughs> you know and i i remember in that dojo with the wooden floors um if anybody would pull up with motorcycles you you knew you were into a fight you know they didn't care if you're a white belt they didn't care if you're yellow they wanted you to quit <laughs> so it wasn't like you know welcome to your intro we're gonna have you we're gonna make you smile and laugh no we're gonna make you bleed <laughs> This is you know, this is the old school way. This is oh this yeah, is really the old old it, mentality. I, you know, I tell my students that all the time. I go, you guys have no freaking clue, man. Shut up and just train. <laughs> you know? So you know they they get all these mats. You know, my kids are spoiled. You know, they I I bought a mat in my dojo, like zebra mats. You know, like the nice ones. You know, and you know they get to hit bags. You know, and I had to hit makawara boards wrapped in rope, bare knuckle. You know, and like. They're like, Sensei, it hurts. And I'm like, oh, you want me to show you what hurts? <laughs> yeah. So, but you know, you got, there's a, there's a fine line between business, making a living um, and having a slower progression and making sure that you can pay your bills and then still attaining the same result. But sometimes it can take longer. So therefore they're, they're more encouraged to stay, you know? So that's another conversation. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 And, you know, we're, we're, we're filling in gaps, right? We know, we know you have a school. We know you still train. We've talked about, you know, this school. But I got the sense as, as we were talking earlier that there might have been others in between. Was this your, your primary instructor for a long time or only? No, I've, I've had several after that. Um, okay. But my main influence was a guy named, oh, he's like Voldemort to me. I never say his name, but his name is Haru. <laughs> Alan. <laughs> okay. You, you don't have to. No, no, no. He deserves credit. Um, you know, I love him. Uh, I'll always love him. He's my sensei. You know, we had different ideologies towards the end, end of our, our training, but I will always, I will always respect the man who trained me the most. And his name was Hiroshi Allen and Hiroshi Allen of Hiroshi, of hero of hero karate. Um, he's in Vegas as well. He's, he's in Summerlin. Um, he trained me all the way to black belt. And, um, but what's very unique about our relationship and how he trained me, he was more like a, you know, he, he was the only father figure that I really had. And he helped me through a lot of my, um, hardest moments in my life. And, you know, he, he, uh, he basically took me under my wing and, uh, you know, there was another man before that, which I'll, I'll discuss in a second, but, um, to give the most credit was, Hiroshi Allen, because I spent at least 10, 11 years with that man. So, you know, and uh, I became his assistant instructor. I did a lot of things um, to help him build that school. And, um, you know, I, I assisted him with tournaments. But I remember I was at a karate tournament. It was the Ozawa Cup. And uh, Hiroshi just started teaching karate. And he was passing out business cards. And he was trying to build his karate school. So we met at the tournament. And I was doing a kata called Teki Shodan. I was about a purple belt, which was about two years in the martial arts training. And I said, oh, my God, you're Hiroshi Allen. You're opening up a school. He goes, yeah. Um, you know, like any martial artist, I'm always very grateful for the people that have trained me. But sometimes there are other teachers that specialize in certain things. Hiroshi was a karate champion 17 times and a national champion. He was also the U S coach for the U S karate team, uh, for the NKF. So I took it upon myself that I wanted to be a competitor and I wanted, I felt that at the time as a teenager, that if I trained with somebody who understood tournaments, I could get better at karate. And I did. So, you know, I, I spent a lot, a lot of time with that man. You know, we would spend hours together. He would train me, you know, until 11 p.m. at night, you know, and I, I became, you know, obsessed with the, that I wanted to become a U.S. teammate, which I never did, but I wanted to be, I wanted to represent the United States karate team. And, you know, I never, I never got to because. Why you know, was that important? We don't realize all of our dreams and that's okay. But I think yeah. understanding what those dreams are and where they come from says a lot about someone. So I'm curious about what that signified for you? You know, I just, I've always been a very emotional man and an emotional person in general. So I've always felt that knowing what the best is, I can learn from that and attain a skill that most people don't have. So I felt that 
you know, fighting under the United States. And I felt like that, you know, knowing that and, but it was, it was a lot of training. I mean, you, you know, my, I'm not very athletic, you know, I'm, I'm okay. I'm pretty average, but you know, there was a lot of really good talent out there that was, that were just, that just were really, really good, you know? And, and one of the hardest things for me, I could never get, and I wasn't a natural at was basically fighting, you know? So even though I'm a martial artist and I fight, when you're fighting at that level, it's a different, it's a different um, demand on your body and your mind, you know? So they were really fast. They were really good. And, and I'm doing it wrong. I'm really fast. I'm pretty damn good. But when you're fighting at a world level or, or, or a national level, those guys are incredible. I mean, you know, they're incredible. So, and I'm not, you know, I'm pretty decent and I've, I've scored a few times on some pretty high end athletes, but it's hard to stay on that level and, um, you know, to fund it too. So money was also an issue. You know, you, you got to have the diet, you gotta, you gotta be traveling, you gotta be fighting all the time. You gotta be, you know, always on it to stay on that level or even come close. So, you know, and, and, you know, you're putting your body through a lot, you know, when you're fighting at that level. And I, I realized that, you know, that I couldn't afford to have that type of lifestyle, even though I wanted it so bad, it was hard, you know, to come up with the money. Cause you, you either had to come up with the money or train and you had to do both. So it was, it was a constant, constant battle, you know? So, um, but you know, I got, I got really far and I, I won a lot of tournaments that were not high end. You know, I won, I won nationals once and, you know, and Hiroshi really helped me through that. And I, I, I did a lot through him. So, you know, there's another guy I want to talk about, but yeah, pretty much that's, that was my main instructor to black belt. So. Okay. Who was the other person you want to talk about? So his name was uh, Dan Sawyer. Um, Dan Sawyer was out of an organization named, do you know Tadashi Yamashita? He did the American Ninjas and stuff. Oh, yeah. Back. Yeah. So I was under his organization for a couple of years. I studied Shoranru. Um, and if nobody knows what Shoranru is, Shoranru Karate is a, is, a pre, is a predecessor to Shotokan. But um, he trained me, and he was actually a World War II vet. Um, and, uh, he was a war two vet that was actually dr there during D-Day. So he's dropping off the soldiers during the war in Germany. So he had a lot of knowledge and stuff. He was just very, um, old school, but he was in the seventies at the time, by the time I met him. And, uh, you know, he had, a, he has a mansion in, in, in the, uh, here in, here in town and behind his, uh, house was a huge dojo. And he would train the students in there all the time. And so I ended up, you know, training with him for a couple of years. I didn't earn any rank with him because, you know, I was bouncing from style to style. And I really still love Shotokan. But long story short, he, he taught me the component of having confidence and having a good attitude and teaching me balance in life. Like he always taught me, you know, you have to be able to take care of your family. You have to be able to do this and do that. You have to be able to put yourself in a good position because he was a very financially stable man. You know, he had, he had a really good life for himself um, because he was, a, he was a show producer in Vegas. So um, after the war, you know, he lived in Hawaii and then he lived in, then he went to Vegas. So, you know, he built his house in Vegas in the middle of nowhere. Um, so Dan Sawyer um, ended up, you know, uh, doing just a lot of great things. There was a book written about him in Japan. You know, there was, there was a lot of things and everybody writes books, but more importantly, what Dan Sawyer was just a great image, just what martial arts can do for a man, you know, or any man or woman, excuse me. Uh, but um, I'm actually making a video game about him. Uh, you know, we're, we're in the process of making a video game and I'll Talk do it. You mind talking about that? That's that. That's a phrase that's never come up on this show in five so, plus years. So, um, you know, a lot of martial artists they make they make documentaries. They make they make you know they do a lot of uh, they write books about themselves, you know, etc. And their knowledge. And I said, you know what? I'm tired of seeing the same thing. I want to be different. Why don't I make a video game about my life? That's exaggerated, of course, um, but. Uh, make it a video game. So I hired a team of about 15 people and you know, they're all, you know, animators and artists and programmers for video games. 
and we're in the process of you know making it. So uh, it's called the Desert Sensei. So if you put hashtag the Desert Sensei, you'll find it all over. So, um, but the Desert Sensei is about a two-year project that's probably going to take us a couple years to make. Um, they're making animations for each and every storyline. Essentially, it's about a martial arts master who's trained in the desert, true story, who's trained by a World War II veteran. And uh, he, his, the, uh, the, World War II, the World War II master is killed in a, in a really bad fire in his dojo. So uh, the character, which is me, ends up you know, going through life uh, and his stories through each level. So he has to beat every level and it tells a story as it goes. Mm. And essentially it's about a martial arts master who, who is alone, but along the way he realizes that sometimes being alone and being, you know, focusing on what you can't, what you are, it'll make you stronger and better. And then at the end of the game, um, you know, he has to face the person who killed his master. So, you know, that's kind of, it, it's, it's kind of like, uh, it's fictional, but it's, it's still, there's a lot of truth to the game. And I felt like instead of writing a book and writing, you know, some sort of, uh, um, everyone where, where everyone does the same thing, I wanted to do something different for the industry. So. Wow. That that's, that's a big undertaking. It is. It's a lot of freaking money. <laughs> I can't believe I'm doing this project, but do I you said, regret you know, it at all? Um, sometimes when I'm sitting there until three in the morning, you know, talking to people, you know, in other countries about my video game, but you know, it, it's, it's coming along really, really well. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, and right now I'm using my photography business to help pay for it. You know, so, sure. uh, but, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of work. We have a couple sponsors for the video game. Um, we have a sponsor, like a, we have a music producer who's sponsoring some of the game as well and uh you know um but the artists are brilliant i mean the artists that have made that put me together and made you know backgrounds and i mean i'm nothing without these guys these guys are just i can't take the credit enough like you know you have uh zaid magdi he's from cairo egypt zaid is zaid magdi he's an amazing animator i mean you know and then you have yaya quasi who who is just a, a character, his character development is just amazing. And then you also have Daimar Lamar, who, who's from Venezuela. And they're, these animators are just incredible, you know. And then I, I also have a, a very talented programmer, uh, you know, um, as well, Greg. So Greg is, I mean, these guys, th these guys make me look like I know what I'm doing. I mean, I can't, I can't, you know, I'm not going to take the credit at all because, I mean, without my team, like I would, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even be in this position, honestly. You know what I mean? So, I know what that's like. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it just, they're designing this amazing video game for my, for me and, you know, and they signed off all rights to me, you know, once, once I get it going, you know, in the next two to three years when it's, when it's done, I'm going to be selling it, you know, on, you know, like any business and sure, of course, you know, it's, I, I, my goal is, is not to make it about me, but to make it about the player and make sure the player has a good, because one thing about myself is I realize I really want to be pro serviced in every part of what I do. I want to make sure that when these people are playing the game, they experience the story, but they have a lot of fun, you know, and they, they, I want them to be able to, you know, enjoy the desert sensei and make sure that they, they just have a lot of fun and, you know, they, they really love the story about what it has to offer because that's ultimately the goal. I don't, I don't really care about, you know, if the story stretches a little bit, what I care about is that, you know, they, everybody enjoys the video game and they, they see my, my viewpoint in the martial arts, you know what I mean? Mm. So, you know. Cool. What's it like seeing yourself come to life in a, in a video game? Is that, is that as surreal as I'd imagine it to be? You know, it is. The first time I saw the character um, design from uh, Yaya Quasi, uh, you know, Yaya, me and him were chopped it up, you know, and he's, he's from Pakistan. And so one of the things I, you know, a lot of people are like, well, why, why don't you hire American artists? And I said, you know, I really love to, but, you know, American artists are really, really expensive, number one. But number two, more importantly, I wanted, because I lived in the desert and I was raised in the desert, I wanted to 
look at people that lived in the desert or that are from the desert. So, you know, I started looking at Middle Eastern um, artists from around the world and, you know, Yaya was one of them. And what's brilliant about this guy is, check this out, you're gonna love this. He, he doesn't draw with his hand. This is crazy. He draws with the mouse. So he's drawing fully animated animations with his mouse. Mm. He doesn't even use his hand, no free hand, nothing. So he uses the mouse because um, in Pakistan, you know, they don't have a lot of money and they don't have a lot of resources. So he learned to draw with the mouse, which is incredible. I mean, you know. Yeah, anybody who's tried to draw anything with a computer mouse knows yeah. that's ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, if you go Very to the, impressive. Yeah, I mean, if you go to the, to, to the page, The Desert Sensei, you know, the video game, you'll see you, the, the artwork is incredible. And it just, it looks like a, a featured animated film, you know, so... You know, and, and Yaya, you know, he's he's drawing motorcycles, he's drawing, you know, other characters, he's drawing backgrounds, I mean, with a mouse. And so it's just, he's, incre he's an incredible, incredible artist, you know. Um, but Zaid, Zaid Magdi, which is from Egypt, Cairo, and Daimar, you know, from Venezuela, their animations, though, they, it just it makes them look so real. What you're asking, which, which is, what's it like? Honestly, it's surreal. Like, I'm very grateful and I, I don't act cocky at all like I just I just if it's just 15 minutes of fame right on you know like all I want to do is just you know tell my story the way I see it and if people love the game and people see the see you know love it that's that's all I care about mm -hmm. you know I don't I don't care about you know leaving a legacy or anything you know, a lot of people a lot of martial arts that get into their heads and honestly the only thing I care about is if people have fun and they enjoy it because, you know, a lot of things that in martial arts, there's, there's always such a rough, there's always that yin and yang, you know, I'm sure a lot of martial arts will talk about that. But yeah. with me, you know, if you're going to have the rough side of martial arts, you also have to have the fun side and the ins inspirational side. And I'm really big on that is, you know, I listen to a lot of inspirational, you know, videos and I'm a photographer and videographer. So I'm really into that because I'm that millennial generation where, you know, it's a new, you know, I'm part of that Facebook era, that part of that social media group. And I want to be part of that. And I want to, I want to inspire people one day to look at that video game or look at that, look at my photography and go, you know what, if he can fight, I can, I can do art too. You know, So I'm, I'm really big on art and expressing myself. So it's not often that we get guests who lean into the artistic side of their persona, their, their creative, their creative. I mean, we've certainly had some, but I think if I was to categorize most of our guests between left and right brain, I'd have to say the majority of them end up as left brain. And that, that could be some selection bias out there, but I, I kind of, I'm curious how martial arts and photography, how, how that connects for you? How'd you get started in photography? And something tells me that the two are pretty strongly tied in your life. Well, to, to me, yeah. I mean, I think so. My karate school phone is ringing. I'll answer it. Don't, don't, don't tell people I don't answer my karate school phone because <laughs> I'm on the radio. <laughs> so if it's ringing, it's probably one of my students asking about belt testing. Um, so uh, I have a huge belt test in the day. And I'm also on another radio show today at 6.30 with the Sport Karate History Museum. Oh, cool. I'm, they do I'm, great work. Yeah, they, yeah. And so uh, I'm one of the, the uh, lead ambassadors for, you know, I, I deal with the karate side of things. And I don't know why they, I don't know why they chose me. They wanted some young guy. And I said, I, and I said, why me? They're like, well, because you know your stuff. And I go, okay. <laughs> so, but okay. Great so, um, but, uh, uh, what I was saying was I think photography and martial arts coincide because martial arts is expressive in that everybody is different. And I think that's, that's everybody's, everybody has that right to a fight can be randomly, you know, happen. And no matter what can happen, you know, if they will punch, you don't know how you're going to react. You're going to react based on a few things. You're going to react on number one, your reflexes, number two, your training, and number three, how much of that training did you apply in real combat, you know? So photography is the same in the sense where I can express myself by showing that martial arts uh, move or that kick in a scenic location, like, you know, 
like if I want to make the photo a little bit darker, if I want to add texture, if I want to express it, add more light, you know, I have all these other options and all these formulas to make that um, expressiveness of, the, of that art. So my goal right now is to get this camera. It's called the Phase One camera. And uh, it's, Peter Lick uses it. It's a really, he's a really famous landscape photographer. And his, his, his photography is just out of this world. I, I'm a huge fan of him. And he has a gallery here in Las Vegas, out in the Venetian. But more importantly, um, people criticize him like crazy online, you know, on YouTube and stuff. But he's like the Michael Jordan of photography for landscape. And he expresses himself however he wants. And in a fight, you don't know what's going to really happen. So let's say you're a Taekwondo guy, right? And you're just really good at kicking. Most likely your reaction is going to be a kick. You know what I mean? Uh, if you're a karate guy, your reaction, and I'm just generalizing, I'm just stereotyping the styles. So if there's any other martial artist listening to this, you know, don't, I'm just, don't think that that's the ultimatum. You know, I'm just saying, uh, you know, if, if somebody attacks you, your reaction is going to be a reverse punch, you know, as a karate guy, right? Well, what if my reaction as a karate guy is a spinning back kick, which would be normally a Taekwondo guy. So what I'm saying is martial arts is also artistic in a sense where you can literally be and do whatever you want, you know, um, and photography to me is kind of the same thing where, you know, you can express the art, you know, uh, through that. Um, and human movement is, is what I'm really, really big on, you know, because everyone is different. Everyone is going to fight differently. There is no, there is no right or wrong style, you know, um, you know, I mean, there are fundamentals to make you fight well, and there are fundamentals in each and every concept of fighting or combatives that will make you react a certain way. But as long as you learn how to block and counter, like it doesn't, it doesn't, what matters is you, you win the fight, you know, <laughs> to me, you know, so um, I don't know how other martial artists feel, but to me, you know, if you get in a situation where you have to fight, that's to me, that's, I think that's a super important thing to be able to use it right away and express yourself right away artistically logically whatever everyone is different you know to me i've always been a i've always been open to almost anything if they know what they're doing of course now i just i don't just ask a guy randomly or across the street hey if i punch you in the mouth how are you going to block it <laughs> no i mean we're talking about other martial artists you know so we just covered a lot of ground there there's a yeah. so there's a lot that we could we could delve into. I got to pause. I know I, I got to, okay. sometimes I get excited. I'm trying not yeah. really hard not to trail on. No, so. no, this is, this is, if, if you were to go back and, and check out all of our episodes and, and long time listeners know this, this is a hallmark of this show is I just let people go because that's where the best stuff comes out. You know, yeah, it's a, I, I think, I think part of the problem is, is that, um, I, I wouldn't say it's a problem. I would say it's a challenge. Uh, I think with martial artists nowadays is you get a lot of martial artists that just think that they're like these ultimate masters. They walk into these mats, you know, they have these huge egos, you know, just totally full of themselves. And, you know, we live in a generation where, you know, that people think that they're, they, they have all these colored, different colored belts and, they, they don't want to recognize that, you know, you got to keep training. You got to keep, you got to keep, you know, training hard. You got to understand what you're doing. You know, you, is what you're teaching going to work for nowadays? You know, I live in Las Vegas, Nevada, the fighting capital of the world, literally the fighting capital of the world. I mean, I was born and raised here. Fighters have been going through my life, you know, in this, in this, in the city, my whole life. So if I'm fighting all these guys that are experts in their field, whether it's jujitsu or boxing, whatever, they're really good. They're really good. You can't fake a fight in this, in this town. You know, if you're a phony, you're going to get called out real fast, you know, and I'm not saying I'm the best. I would never claim that because there's a lot of badass people in my town. I mean, I, you know, and I tell people that I said, listen, I'm a pretty decent fighter, but there, there's some, there's some scary people in, in Vegas. You know, I'm not going to lie. There's a lot of good martial artists, but because of that, it forced me to be better. Because of that, 
it forced me to make sure that whenever I trained my students, they were learning something that would, that would, you know, help them, you know, like I'm not going to teach somebody to do a flying sidekick just for fun. I'm, I'm going to make sure that they, they can, when they learn it, they can actually use it in a real situation, you know, and, and that's, that's a really, really important fact. Uh, one of the things I think that we forget is you get a lot of these martial arts masters that, you know, that they've never sparred. It's all theory. They, all they talk about is theory, theory, theory. And, you know, sparring is, is a super important component. Now, is there technical and kata and self-defense? And a lot of uh, martial artists will argue, well, you, know, you, you, don't, uh, you don't get to use all the rules in, in a real life situation. In kata, you, you learn how to, you know, break their arm and do this. But I mean, of course we don't want that, but sparring is the closest thing to a real fight that you can get, right? So what I'm saying is to, with me, maybe I'm just young, maybe I'm just a, a young karate teacher, but to me, I feel that we need to be responsible as martial arts instructors or martial arts in general to go towards this uh, movement where martial artists are not looking at their ranking, but they're looking at um, what they're doing as a community and how we're moving our martial arts forward to the next generation. You know, my school motto is uh, in age, my, my school is called ageless martial arts. And my school motto here is uh, rise together, achieve as one. And our, if you haven't seen our symbol, it's an A symbol that represents a Phoenix and uh, Greek mythology. A Phoenix is basically some dies and rises from the ashes. Again, that's why we have gray and blue. Blue is the color of the fire that represents our spirit in our school. So what I'm saying is, um, go ahead. I like that. I like that. It's a nice visual. Yeah. So, so, you know, um, we, going back to martial artists that need to understand that we have a responsibility. I mean, as we get older, you know, the, the old school martial arts that trained with, you know, the original masters and stuff like that, we have a responsibility. I feel strongly that as we're training the next generation, we need to realize that we are there to help them be their best, but also be responsible in that, making sure that the martial arts is, is going to work. You know, um, everyone knows martial arts exists. It's not like the seventies or eighties where, you know, it was this forbidden, you know, activity where nobody knew, you know, I mean, martial arts is so well known because of the UFC and especially in my town, you know, it's just, everybody knows about it. You know, it's not like a, it's not like a foreign thing anymore. And it's, it's such a generalized thing now. It's like sports or soccer or, you know, uh, those other sports. But what's important is that we have to hold other martial arts masters responsible. You know, you have a lot of people that are, that are just, you know, decimating our image, you know, people are, you know, talking about, you know, no knockout punching and this, this, this chi, this inner chi. And I just, I don't, I don't think that's right personally. I mean, I know that's a, that's a touchy subject. I know I'll probably won't, you know, ha make everybody happy saying that, but I, I think that people need to at least at the very least teach people that, you know, we need to, um, we need to be responsible with our skills and, and make sure that, you know, even though we might not be the best in the world or we might not be uh, the very, um, you know, we might not be UFC fighters, we still should be able to teach techniques that are effective to our, to our students, you know, and that's just my, my gripe on that. <laughs> so. I agree. Yeah. I, I, I completely agree. Wow. So you just you added you added to the pile of the stuff that I could that I could get into. I want to talk about your school. Sure. You know, I, I imagine that there's some some full circle going on. You know, I imagine that at some point when you decided to open a school, you thought about what it martial arts represented for you and how impactful it was for you when you got started. You know, what did that journey from student to instructor to school owner look like? It was really rough. I mean, everybody has their story. Um, it was really rough in that I, I dropped out of college to do this, actually. Mm. Um, I didn't really finish school because I kept bouncing. And uh, I'm not really good at 
I was never really good at comprehension. And I, later I found out I had ADHD pretty bad. And now that I think about it, it makes sense. But um, uh, I was really bored with everything. You know, I, w I went to U UNLV, uh, University of Las Vegas, and I finished all my credits at the community college. And, you know, I wanted to actually be a doctor and I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't have the capacity to really get there, but it was very difficult. You know, school for me was really hard sitting there, reading a book, trying to understand and comprehend was really, really hard for me. So, um, I ended up going to college and I ended up, uh, you know, not doing too well. Um, I wanted, I took like this biology course like five times and it was just, it was brutal for me. <laughs> it was, and my, and I was an idiot because one of the guy or one of the teachers to, to add to the pain, my professor, her name was professor blizzard <laughs> and she had really, really bad reviews, but, but I'm really stubborn. So I said, no, I'm going to take her course. And I took her course and I got, I got, you know, professor blizzard. If you ever hear this, I love you. Don't, you know, she was just this, short, you know, stocky old woman who was very, you know, um, coarse. And she, the first day we sat in the room in biology course and her first line out of her mouth was 50% of you will fail this course. The other 50% of you will get a C 20% of you will get an A good luck. <laughs> That's what she said to me. And I was, I was that 50% that got net, but I took her course three times and I finally passed no five times, but with two and other instructors. But my point is, is that I gave up, you know, college to go into the karate school and, um, uh, I lived in my karate school in 2012. I was in my young twenties and I slept in it. My parents thought I was crazy. And I said, no, I, I really want to, I really want to do this. This is something I really love and I'm really good at it. You know, I, I spent my whole life doing it. Why can't I make a living? So, um, I, I trained, I fought, I started before, I, excuse me, before I opened up the karate school, I started at a rec center and I had this one, I'm bouncing here. Sorry. I'm mixing timelines. No, it's all right. Keep going. Keep so going. I, I had this little girl named little Maria. And she was a Hispanic girl. She was, she was, she was kind of short, kind of stubby. She was, her name was, I called her little Maria because for six months I sat in a rec center and this rec center, it's like in the middle of nowhere. Like, and it's in the very poor community. I'm not knocking any poor community. I'm glad I got to help, you know, less privileged kids. And I, I'm, I'm really happy I got to do that. But, you know, I went, I taught this little kill kid and every single day I had a huge, like a, like a fan, like a, like a rolling pack with all my stuff in it. And I had a karate scroll. And if you look through my Facebook, they would lay blue mats on the mat and they only paid me $35 a month. And the rec center took 60% of that. And I kept 40%. So I only, I only, I was, I was only getting paid $17 a month to teach one student for six months. Mm in that rec center. <laughs> so it was, a, it was terrible. It was really, really bad. I mean, I mean, I'm very grateful for that opportunity. What but, kept you going through that? You know, I just, I just loved it. I loved it. You know, I love, I love the fact that I could, I couldn't believe I was getting paid to do karate in my mind at the time. I mean, I was like 20, 21 at the time when I did that 22. Um, and I just couldn't believe that somebody was paying me to teach karate to me that, I mean, to most karate people, they're like, you're crazy. You're not getting paid what you're worth. But to me at the time, you know, as I was doing karate as a job, somebody was giving me money to teach him how to punch and kick and teach him the values of martial arts. And to me, I, I realized right then and there, I knew what I wanted to do. You know what I mean? So uh, that, that was a really, really big moment for me. And I don't know, I hate talking about myself. So it's, 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 but to me, that was a very pinnacle moment. So I said, you know what, I'm going to stick with this. So for six months I waited it out and then more kids started coming and then they started, you know, training with me. And a couple of those kids ended up getting black belts uh, from the rec, which was about that's 10. Oh wow. It's been 10 years now. That was 10 years ago, 2010. So time flies. That's huge. Now what, 
let, let's let's go back. Let's talk about that. Six months, one kid, seventeen dollars yeah. a month. Yeah, I I've been to Vegas once. I know yeah. that it's a big area. I'm going to guess that that seventeen dollars m- might have covered your gas. Yeah, yeah, it didn't Maybe. even cover my gas. No, but and, but to me, I wasn't thinking about the money. I was thinking, oh my god, I get to do something that I love. Right. This was this was, you know, like somebody's trying to learn from me, but I was just an assistant, you know, because I just got my black belt and you know I love my sensei, but me and him kind of had a we split yeah. apart, you know, like like every martial arts instructor or another student, they they always separate from their instructor. That always happens, you know. And but at the time, I had no teacher. I was I was uh, I had no I was no longer training at the capacity that I wanted to. So I realized that, um, you know, I wanted to start doing this for a living. And I was born and raised in this town. And, you know, I felt, I felt kind of like, well, you know, I know my city better better than anybody else in, in, in the world. You know, I should be a community leader, leader in the, in, you know, in my town. So that I know maybe that was a little bit of entitlement, maybe it was cockiness or maybe it was confidence, whatever you want to call it. I felt like I wanted to be a Vegas born person that would help the city grow up and be part of that because a lot of kids grow up in the city, not having community or having somebody who was born here. A lot of people come from California. It's a very transient town. So I wanted to be one of the first born and raised people in this town to show people that people that are from Vegas could, could also be good, you know, members of society and also have a great life living here. You know, not just worried about the the casinos and the, and the, and the gambling and the drinking and the bars that all happens in, in the inner city, but the outskirts of our city, you know, I wanted to be a representation of that, that I could still be a great role model to these kids growing up. Um, and I hope that doesn't come out cocky. I just no, wanted to no, show. No. Yeah. I just, I just wanted to show that you could still come from a, AK sin city, but still create good members of society. And that's, that was, that was in the back of my head for many years. Cause a lot of people that talk bad about Vegas, they would always be like, Oh, Vegas sucks. Oh, Vegas is nothing but, you know, this and this. And I was tired of that. So I wanted, when people ask me, they're like, where are you from? And I'm like, I'm from Vegas. They're like, really? I was like, yeah, born and raised. I love it. You know? So I love, I love the dirt. I love the dry heat. It's just mm. something I love. So yeah. it comes through for sure. Where, where are you from? By the way, I I'm in Vermont. Have... Oh, I'm, I've been there. I'm about as really I'm about yeah. as opposite of uh, Vegas as you got. I went to, um, I went to a wedding there. I drove actually, I drove across the country to go to Vermont. <laughs> really? Wow. Yeah, it when was, was a, this? terrible. This was um, in 20, 20 uh, what is that, 2014? Yeah, I was I here. Drove, yeah, I drove from Vegas to Vermont for a wedding. My, my best friend was getting married. He's Do you not remember a, where the wedding was? Uh, no, I don't remember. We, we, we've got a handful of towns that are really known for weddings, and I'm kind of in the middle of quite a few of them. Yeah, yeah, it was in like this little church. You know, it was like, it, it looks like a fairy tale. You know, I'm not used to yeah. seeing greener trees. So to me, <laughs> trees, it's just like, I feel like I'm in, I feel like I'm in like a dragon's forest, you know, when I see trees. So it's. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, and, and I felt like I was inside a dragon's mouth when I came out to visit Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I do not love the, the heat or the dry. Oh, uh, I, love I, yeah. I, I love it because here's why there's no bugs trying to kill you. There's no. There's no spiders. There's no humidity. You know, it's great. You know, it's like I can literally stand in the middle of the desert and not sweat. And people think I'm crazy. And that's one of the reasons why they call me the desert sensei, because I know all the places around the <laughs> desert. You could drop me in the middle of Nevada and I would know how to get home. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And you could, you could do the same thing with me here in, in quite a few spots in New England. Yeah. The desert sensei. How how do you get that moniker? That's it's very, again, a, a good visual. We've had a lot of really powerful visuals of who you are in our conversation today. Well, I appreciate that. And, you know, I'm sure you interview a lot of people and I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of great, great martial artists that you have interviewed. And, you know, 
like I said, I get uncomfortable talking about myself. <laughs> so, but the Desert Sensei, um, I just felt like it was a really good ring. You know, I was born in the desert. Um, I was raised here. I was trained here. And um, it just, it was, the Desert Sensei was, it just had a good ring to it. You know, I just felt like it was very accurate to what the game was trying to portray. And actually my school logo is on the karate uniform in the game. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a very um, deep meaning to it because a lot of times when you hear the word sensei, it's, it's a Japanese term. It's a very Asian term. But then when you hear the desert, there's no Asian in that, you know? So, you know, when you hear the desert, you, you think of something Middle Eastern or something, you know, North American desert, you know, it's, it's very Western when you hear that. So it's, I feel like it's a, it's a really good mix of uh, modern and, and something traditional, you know, but yeah. it, you know what I mean? So that's, it was just a very good ring to it. And I felt like um, if you go to the desert sense, a, a documentary, they did the documentary, just a short clip about me of how I, uh, I, um, I run my dojo and, um, uh, um, Haraya and Walter, they, they created that documentary for me. And, you know, he's a great guy. He, he did the documentary about me and how I ran the school. And what's cool about that is when we, when we filmed that, uh, we went out to Gene Lake. It's a, it's a, it's a dry desert lake. And, um, there was a desert storm that happened right in the middle of the desert lake. So when you watch that film, uh, I'm, I'm doing kata and I'm doing fighting techniques in the middle of a desert storm. It looks awesome. Like, <laughs> it looks so dramatic. And I, and I'm really happy that it, it just, it, I'm just like, I just laugh and I go, wow, I'm such a dramatic person. <laughs> that's really cool. That's, was, that's pretty fortunate. Cool. It seems like something out of uh, what's coming to mind for me is avatar, the animated yeah. series. Yeah. You know, I, I watch like it. It's just a 30 second um, clip, but Man, I told I told Walter, you know, the the director and and the and the producer. I said, I said, I said, Walter, man, did you see that clip? He's, I'm like, I look like I look like a badass mofo. You know, and he goes, you are. <laughs> so it was a great, you know, it was a great experience, and it was it was great filming it. And he he did a hell of a job filming me. And uh, you know, Haraya and Walter, you know, I I hope they're doing well. You know, they got hit pretty hard with the virus and. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I know that they have a, they have a website and they, they have their whole story too up as well. So, yeah, we're going to get all this stuff linked up in the show notes and in case somebody's new whistle kick martial arts radio.com in case you skipped over the intro. That's, that's where we put that stuff. Yeah. Tell, tell us about your school. Let's, let's start to wind down here, but I, I want to know about your school. I want to know how, how you go through six months persisting with a, with a single student and then you've turned it into your your career, your full-time job, or at least close to it. And um, you got the photography as well. Yeah, I got the photography. And if you go to Lorenzo Sandoval.com, um, that's my photography page. But if you go to agelesskarate.com, um, you'll see, um, you know, my karate school, but essentially, you know, I, I just been very lucky. Uh, I had a really great landlord uh, who helped me out through this difficult time, but more importantly, you know, I, I wake up, and I get to do the job of my dreams. You know, I don't take it for granted. I literally wake up to do karate. <laughs> like, mm. I, I can't believe, there's not a lot of people that do this. And that's there's not a lot of people that can say that do this. Um, and times are really, really rough right now for me. Uh, I don't know what it's like for other martial arts schools, but for me, uh, coronavirus, you know, COVID hit me really hard. So, you know, we lost a lot of people and I've been yeah. trying to teach online, but it's just not the same, you know, so. Uh, and, you know, I, coming to the school, I wake up, I, I go to, you know, I call my leads, I, I try to, you know, prepare, you know, I, I, I order equipment, order belts, I make sure, you know, we have belt testing this week. So, you know, I make sure everyone's belts and certificates are ready to go. Uh, you know, I, I do everything I can to make sure the school and all the members are happy. But, you know, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, like anything, you know, so. Uh, I think that what we need to do is um, my typical day is just I wake up, I come here to the school and, you know, I just, I, I'm in a pretty uh, quiet location, so we don't have a lot of walk-in traffic. Mm -hmm. So most of my, most of my leads and my students come from online. So, you know. 
And if people want to, you mentioned your two websites there. What about social media? Any, any other places people might want to check you out, follow you? What you yeah. Got going? So if you want to follow me, um, you can check out Ageless Martial Arts. That's Ageless uh, Martial Arts. Uh, you can find that all over the internet from Instagram to social media to Facebook. Um, and if you want to check out the Desert Sensei, the video game, you can see that. You'll see that on Facebook as well. And then also my photography page, uh, Lorenzo Sandoval. Uh, you know, fine art photographies, you'll see all of that. My wedding stuff as well, because I do weddings. But I'm, I'm, I have my hands a lot uh, in a lot of things. Um, but, you know, I feel like I'm managing pretty well. You know, I think that's every entrepreneur and that's every that's just what we do entrepreneurs yeah. are, you want to do a lot of things so but um yeah so i can relate for sure well, this is this has been fun i appreciate you coming on and okay. i i always ask the guests to choose how we're going to go out you know this is your episode we've been talking and you've shared a lot of great stuff with us you know in a minute we're going to roll out to the outro so this is your chance to close up this part of the show and leave the audience with your final words. Um, if, there, if there are people listening, you know, I, I want you guys to, I hope I, nobody was offended in my opinions, uh, but I think that uh, as a sensei, um, as someone who is a young sensei, you know, I'm 34 right now. So I, I just want to say to everybody who's listening, you know, I really appreciate you guys hearing my story and, I think it's awesome that there are so many other martial artists that listen to the show and there's a lot of people that uh, have their own story. And I think that we all have our own story. We have our, our different way to get to the top and uh, to get to that success. Everybody has their own story. And, um, and speaking of which, I just want to do a shout out to Brennan Beliso. Brennan Beliso is a martial arts consultant. He runs one martial arts in San Francisco. He's been helping me a lot too with my business and my, my mindset. I, I love that guy. You know, he's, he's a great, great, uh, guy. And I just, I should have said that earlier. Um, but, uh, just an outro, I just want to say that, you know, um, uh, we need to start looking at how we're going to help more martial artists progress because there's so much technology. There's so much things that are happening in the life that we need to keep up with it. You know, if we, if we want to survive as, you know, if you want to keep your style alive or you want to, you know, keep your traditions alive, a lot of people, they, they only want to teach what they, and they want to hide it. You know, I think that everybody needs to share their knowledge. And a lot of times, a lot of masters are very, you know, um, private about their knowledge. And I, I just, I, I believe that the more information that there's out there, it'll inspire more um, to make us better as a community, as a martial arts community. And I think that's super important. Uh, a lot of people just think that they're above that and we need to stop that. We need to realize that there's, there's so much information. And as the older masters are dying or they're getting older, that needs to be put out. Otherwise we'll never know what that technique is, or we'll make similar techniques that, that you'll never know what those transcripts are. Like, you know, like the Shaolin monks, like none of that stuff was written or put on, you know, it was very rare for them to see it. So, you know, they drew it, but I think it's really, really important that we, we share that knowledge and we, we pass it along uh, as martial artists, you know, so. You know, I've been doing this for a long time and I can always tell when someone is willing to put the arts or not just martial arts, but anything that has given them so much, they're willing to put that first. And that's really what I see in today's guest. The projects that he's working on, the things that he's got happening. Sure, there's the hope that they return at least what you put in. But that doesn't make for a very good investment, does it? Unless you consider the betterment of the world as a return. And I have no doubt that Sensei feels that way. So thank you, sir. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for sharing your time. And uh, next time I'm out in Vegas, we'll have to connect. If you want to know more, get the links, the everything, the social media, the photos, all the stuff related to today's episode, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Find episode 536. You can search. You can look through lists. There's all kinds of ways to find the episodes. And that's where you'll find that stuff. If you love this show, if you love what we're doing at Whistlekick, 
even a tenth as much as I do. If you appreciate it at all, please consider supporting our Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash whistlekick. We give you back. It's not a good way to say that. We give back to you for what you give to us. It's another way of saying you're going to get exclusive stuff that you won't find anywhere else. Of course, there are plenty of free ways you can help us out from leaving reviews and sharing episodes to talking to your friends about Whistlekick or simply following us on social media at Whistlekick anywhere you can think of. And if you see somebody out there, maybe they got a Whistlekick sweatshirt or hat on or something like that, go say hi. Introduce yourself. We are building a global community of traditional martial artists and you are part of it. If you've got guest suggestions, email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. And that's all I've got for you today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Mm -hmm.